Um, you know, I think as we sort of move on the water and the way we're trying to kind of align with the river current or move through the river current of life, um, that I think the hardest thing, the biggest expenditure of energy is, is accelerating from a dead stop. Mm -hmm. And so it is not on, it's not unlike when you ride a bicycle approaching a stop sign if you can just keep the wheels moving a little bit, it is yeah. so much easier to accelerate a bike that's moving a little bit than a bike from a dead, a dead stop. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpri. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpri's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe bomb today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today is an Olympic gold medalist in whitewater canoe slalom. In fact, the first American uh, to ever get that gold in that event. Um, he's also a performance coach. Welcome to the show, Joe Jacoby. Hey, Jesse. It is great to be here today. And uh, as... Uh, if you're a longtime listener, you know I'm always excited to have uh, cross-planet conversations like we're having this morning, although you wouldn't necessarily think of it um, since Joe's American, but he doesn't live uh, in the U.S. anymore. He's trekked across the planet uh, to live in Spain, so we'll, we'll just jump off right there because we before we got recording, Joe and I were going to get into this, and I said we'll save it, save it for the recording. <laughs> Joe, why why did you move across the planet? Um, are we not good enough for you anymore? Did, did we do something <laughs> wrong? Have we offended you? Not at all. I look, I think that, you know, so you mentioned that I was a gold medalist in the sport of whitewater canoe slalom and the sport I grew up, I learned how to canoe at summer camp in the Washington DC area when I was eight years old. By the time I was 10, I was like hooked, really liked it. And as I started to kind of open up aspirations to compete internationally, and I grew up at the Potomac River in the Washington DC area was like the perfect place, great whitewater river rapids, a great community with which to train. But the Europeans were, you know, our, the, Amer the US team was doing really well in international competition, but the sport was really anchored in Europe. And so a lot of our biggest races, World Cups, World Championships, all, you know, many, of the, of the Olympic games, you know, you know, have been in Europe as well. And so, yeah, I started to travel to Europe when I was 16 years old every summer and I made a lot of friends here. Um, I had a lot of success in canoeing. I really enjoyed the rivers here, but I also just enjoyed the time off the water here. And that was actually a big part of my 1992 Olympic story, uh, Jesse, was that, I mean, we had a, a goal on the water but we were spending a lot of time here in La Seo de the this uh, town about two hours north of Barcelona that was hosting the whitewater canoeing events for the 1992 Olympic Games when Barcelona was hosting those Olympic Games. And I, I was always a little bit envious of my European competitors that just always felt so home and uh, at home and comfortable uh, when we were racing. I mean, we were far from home when we were racing. And um, yeah, I kind of, a year before the Olympics, I kind of had this in, this was 1991. I was here in La Seo d'Urge. We were having a, a race, a test event on the course. And it was a chance for the athletes to see the water. And it was a chance for the organizers to make sure that the course uh, functioned properly and the scoreboard was working, all those kind of things. And I had this epiphany a year before the Olympics uh, that was, I didn't want to wake up in the Olympic village feeling like an American visitor in the village. Like I wanted to feel a sense of belonging. And so from that moment, I, I can't tell you, like it was just, I literally, something changed. And my interactions with the community here in Laseo changed. 
you know, going to the supermarket or a cafe was not just this transactional thing like I need food or I need a pizza, you know, it was more, these are like neighbors, you know, these are, I'm really kind of thinking of people along those lines. And so on the day of the Olympic games in 1992, a year later, uh, that box was checked. I mean, I really felt a sense of connection, a sense of belonging here. And so, yeah, I think after winning the Olympics here, that just kind of deepened the whole connection. So, yeah, I saw an opportunity uh, a little over four years ago uh, to make this quality of life change as sort of a new life adventure. Now I'm kind of finally answering your question. Here I wake up every morning and I kind of shift into a mode of like, surviving here it means to learn here like i have to wake up with a sense of learning like i can't check out like i can't go walk out of my house and presume that everyone is going to speak english no one speaks english like mm-hmm. i've got to speak a different language so i'm learning like my brain just goes into like learning mode mm-hmm. and i love that like that has been an incredible gift like and an incredible wake up i'm 52 years old now And yeah, I'm not very good at speaking Catalan, which is the language we speak here in La Ceo, but um, I love learning it and I love practicing it. And, but I've got to be a a student in order to pull that off. Like there's, I can't check out, which I think in a lot of ways when you're just, I think when you speak English and you're in the United States, like why would you even think twice about that? Mm. Once you live in another country, you think about it all the time. Yeah, there's something about um, going someplace where they don't speak English um, and being the outsider looking in that, you know, that initial kind of jumping off point, it's like, it gives you a different perspective about, I mean, a lot of things I know. So like, I, I actually recently did a, a video on the YouTube channel, uh, if you like running, talking about should you do running on vacation we just came back from a, a short trip to Montreal which is a city I fell in love with um, and learned um, a, a modicum of French and there's it, it's definitely like you know there's attitudes in the U.S. about oh I speak English if you live here and stuff and I feel like I don't guess I don't want to get too political but it, it it gives you a different perspective about that situation because you're now the outsider coming into a a place where they don't speak the language that you speak and you're trying your best to ingratiate yourself, but it's tough. Like, (laughs) unless you're a language savant, like it's going to take a minute to get anywhere near to, you know, sounding like you belong, let alone like being comfortable with different culture and whatever's going on. Yeah. The, you know, it, you bring up something that I, I think, you know, one of the things that I just love about American English is that English in the United States is just constantly changing and evolving. Listen, it was not so long ago. It was not so long ago that uh, when Al Gore was vice president and his wife, Tipper Gore, was like wanted to have like movie ratings, like on, on rap lyrics, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and today, I mean, if you look at the influence of hip hop on the way English is spoken, mm-hmm. that we don't think about that very much in the United States, but you know, in, in, in England in Great Britain, <clears throat> United Kingdom, where you know, there's a lot of people hanging on, hanging on to proper English. In the United States, we're not. We're sort of letting English go in a lot of different directions, mm-hmm. which is fascinating. And if you actually ask kids in Spain, like the kind of English they want to speak, they want to speak cool English. Mm-hmm. They want to speak like hip hop. Like they want to watch Netflix. They want, they love that influence. And it's, that reminds me that when I am speaking Catalan, that I'm not striving for some perfect Catalan and I'm, right. I'm speaking conversations with people like a lot of Americans who appreciate any, someone's effort to speak English. Like you can imagine someone who speaks Spanish as the first language and you're mm-hmm. having a conversation with them and maybe they're not very good at talking in the past tense or the future tense. Mm-hmm. But they speak in the past tense and you kind of, I mean, in the present tense, but you understand 
we can intuitively understand whether yeah. they're talking about the past or the future. Right. You know, uh, you know, it, it, and that's the way I sort of think, I think we, when you find that kind of that, um, sense of, uh, that ease of communicating and going across the globe, it makes speaking another language a lot easier to even being an American and loving that kind of English. And, and the kids here like to talk English with me because mm -hmm. I, I am not a stickler for how, how they speak it. Yeah. And therefore I, you know, my Catalan is sort of received in a similar way. And I love that. That's great. You know, it, <laughs> thinking about the, the rules of English versus the realities of English. I have a Brazilian friend, um, who English is his third language and he speaks it very, very well. It, it, it's very close. His cadence is a little different. Um, I always, which is funny. I always fall into like his cadence whenever I'm talking with him. Yeah. Um, but like we talk about the, he gets most of it. It just, you wouldn't even really know most of the time, but just aside from his accent, but sometimes we talk about the, just the weird ways we finish sentences that are grammatically very wrong, but oh, so common. And so it's like, if you learn English in a classroom and then you hear it, you're like, what? Like there should be more to that sentence. So it's some, something, was wrong, something was wrong. And then trying to explain that situation, like, yeah, that's wrong, but we just, we use like, like where are you at is a good example. People say that as like, that's not right in the slightest. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, <laughs> it would take me back to third grade. My, my, I remember my teacher talking about prepositional phrases and how to use them properly. But um, it, so it's, it's good to hear that like, that the attempt is appreciated versus it being like a, um, almost a snub, like, oh, you don't speak, you don't speak the language properly, you know. Actually, you know, and it, it's, it, this was interesting. I mean, obviously, everyone where I live can speak Spanish, mm -hmm. right? I mean, everyone can, but I think speaking Catalan is, is, is a mm -hmm. way that Catalan people, it's one of the most important ways that they can pr preserve, you know, the, their, their Catalan heritage and, and spirit. And I think that, you know, we don't, when you, when you come to Spain today, I mean, you, you're coming to a country in Western Europe, you're not, it's not easy to remember that just as recently as the mid 1970s, this country was, was run by a very different kind of leader. Mm -hmm. You, you were not allowed to speak Catalan, you know, and it's like, so if you're of a certain age here, not very old, but you know, if you were in your 50s, you know, you went to school and you did not learn how, you didn't learn how to speak your native tongue, which is Catalan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you learn Spanish. And um, I, I think that when I ask people, could you imagine going to school and like, you know, and you were prohibited, you know, you, you kind of speak English at home, although it's really not permitted by, by law. And you know you can't learn it at um, at school. Uh, I when I'm invited into schools today to speak English to you know at classes you know here in Catalonia, I always remind the kids it's like you cannot believe how fortunate you are to get to go to school and be able to converse in Catalan today and learn grammar in Catalan and and I, I think it is it's. This is such an interesting lens, you know, for me, you know, to be here now and kind of seeing all this and sort of seeing these evolutions, because it can be very easy to sort of take things for granted and not mm -hmm. really appreciate. But it wasn't very long ago that Spain looked a lot different than it does today. And, um, and so, but yeah, language is a big part of that. When I, it is generally presumed, like if you walk into a, a cafe anywhere in Catalonia, if, if I present myself as being, you know, not from here, which is not too hard to identify, the expectation is that we're going to speak English. And so what I love, I love walking into a bakery, you know, a, a patisseria or a forn de pa, and there's an, you know, an old woman or two old, old, old women, you know, working behind the counter and they, they'll say, they'll greet me in Spanish and then I'll greet them back in Catalan. And they just, they smile. 
and it just delights them. It surprises them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think like, I, I couldn't put a price on that. Speaking Catalan is not the most practical language in the world. Like it, I, I can't do much with it beyond these very small area that, that I live in, but it delights people. And it's very yeah. unexpected for an American to, you know, to sort of change that conversation. Yeah. Uh, with a Catalan who's expecting to speak Spanish. Yeah. And now you're speaking Catalan with them and it's like, they light up. And, and I just, I can't tell you how that makes my day, Jesse. Like it, it's, it's awesome. It really motivates me to kind of keep, keep going with, with my Catalan, just to be able to say, uh, ask a few questions, ask mm -hmm. them how their day is going and, and you know, what, well, what are they seeing in the world today? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's, yeah. it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I think it comes back to maybe just a, a, a part of human nature and that's respect, right? It's like a respecting of their heritage or respecting that like that's their language. You're not saying I'm a foreigner in your land, speak my language. It's no, no, I'm going to try my best. Maybe I'm going to botch it, but like I'm going to try and, you know, respect where you come from and, and who you are. And, you know, when I talk to the kids here in Los Ceo, I've never met one kid who thinks their English is good enough to go to the United States <laughs> and speak. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, I said, it's not like 99% are going to understand you, you know, 100% are going to understand what you're saying. If you speak like we're speaking now, anywhere in the country, people are going to understand what you're saying. Yeah you may not understand everyone else. Like I, before I moved here, I was, uh, I lived in uh, Appalachia. You know, I lived mm -hmm. in Southeastern Tennessee. And I think it would be not, you know, I know that a lot of my neighbors here in Los Angeles would have a hard time understanding my neighbors in Ducktown, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Enough, that is totally cool. They would be understood. Having said that, you know, I also know that someone who speaks Spanish as the first language is not going to go to the United States and starve or get lost. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's just they speak enough English to prevent that. And likely they speak enough Spanish to, you know, to do you can, you know, that likely find those pockets. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. You know, you're, you're not going to starve. You're not going to get lost. You know, you're, you're going to be OK. But I think it is interesting. Most of the kids here don't think they have what it takes just to go spend a week there. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like, not only should you go, it's like, I actually make the case the United States is probably a, even a, a, a better place to go and speak English in that way than say going to the United Kingdom where you'll probably be, be corrected a lot, you know, as opposed to just, you know, you get into a conversation with, with an American on the street, you know, our English has just changed so much. We're all about just, sort of conveying the message at this point. I'm not trying to correct you and, and make and tell you how to be, how to speak properly, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Look, look, I mean, you look at our co Congress today or look at uh, the government of the United States today. We, we have people that have learned to speak English that are, you know, elected representatives that, um, you know, have learned to speak English in very different ways. And I think that's awesome. It's um, definitely, in underappreciated skill that is acquiring a second language in the U.S. because we're such a, not a monolith, but the country's so large and it's like, there's so many people, you don't really bump into very many situations where you have to speak another language. You know, there's opportunities, yeah. there's opportunity, like when you're talking about, I'm in Kansas City, there's many pockets of Spanish speaking community around town. Um, there's, I mean, just down the street from me, there's a French immersion school for kids in this neighborhood. Um, so there's definitely opportunities to speak other languages, yeah. but there's rarely, I would say never. I don't think I've ever had a situation where I had to speak Spanish and definitely not French um, in, in Kansas City. So I think, that, I think that's part of something that we just forget about because there's so it's it's so predominantly English speaking we don't you know unlike Europe where like you've got all the countries with all their languages butting up against each other and it's not it's very feasible as we we're talking about before we were recording pop over someplace else and you know English or or something becomes the de facto common language if you don't it understand is. where 
it actually, I mean, English is the official language of the, of the European Union. And so it is interesting how, you know, when I, I, I outside my window right now, we're, uh, we're hosting a, a, a race, a, comp a canoeing competition in, on the 92 Olympic course. And we have athletes here from uh, France, from Ireland, uh, and then from all over Spain. And for the Spanish athletes, Spain is, is the common language, although most of the Spanish athletes come from places like the Basque country where Basque is a really, really different language. Mm -hmm. The Catalans speak Catalan. The Galicians have, have their own language. There's, there's a, I mean, it, these don't sound like Spanish when you speak them. Uh, speak, they're very different. But mm -hmm. then they all put that aside when they're at a race to do that. But, to, you know, to, I always hear Spanish and French athletes speaking English with each other. Or German and... Um, you know, French or Spanish athletes, Italian athletes, English is the go is, is the go between uh, language. Yeah. Um, we could probably talk language the whole hour, but we'll, we'll I'm going to divert so that we uh, try to get a little bit, a uh, little bit other topics for, for those that are not um, language aficionados with us. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, so, so for you, the listener, if you've been around with me for, um, you know, a number of years now, or listen to a number of episodes, uh, you've heard me make the metaphor, and this is why I think it's especially important to ask you, Joe. I make the metaphor somewhat often about life as a river, and I saw in one of your blog posts talking about using life, you know, a river as a metaphor for life. Um, it's because, my book that I'm working right, on. Right, I'm working so, on the book right now. So you know, I use it as a metaphor. I think there's a lot of parallels, but you know, you've got obviously more firsthand physical experience than I'll ever have in, in being in the, literally in the river. Um, so I wanted to little, ask you a little bit about your perspective of a, a river as a metaphor for life. Um, and then in particular, I had, I had a couple quotes from your, um, your post, a full deck of questions. Um, I, I liked the one about what if, what if we sustain minimum speed without stopping as opposed to pursuing top speed with frequent stops. Um, so I just kind of want to use that as a starting point and then let you freestyle a little bit and I guess tell us a little bit about your perspective, your thoughts on that, that, that kind of metaphor. Yeah, so we'll try. I, 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 I love all, I mean, I had such great time writing the full deck of questions. And I'm so glad you asked about that one. So I'd love to tell you a little bit about where that particular question came from about maintaining the minimum speed versus maximums, you know, without stopping versus high speed with lots of stops. Um, you know, I think as we sort of move on the water and the way we're trying to kind of align with the river current or move through the river current of life, um, that... I think the hardest thing, the biggest expenditure of energy is, is accelerating from a dead stop. Mm -hmm. And so it is not on, it's not unlike when you ride a bicycle approaching a stop sign. If you can just keep the wheels moving a little bit, it is yeah. so much easier to accelerate a bike that's moving a little bit than a bike from a dead, a dead stop. Right. And if you figure out how to do that over and over again, you know, the same thing when you turn uh, a canoe or kayak, uh, you're losing precious straight ahead speed. So if you can figure out how to keep a little bit of speed, go and, and when you're racing a canoe down the river in the Olympic games, um, you're never going more than two or three strokes before it's time to turn. And you're never gonna be turning for more than a few strokes before it's time to go straight ahead. So you're constantly changing between turning and going straight ahead, turning and going straight ahead. And so it, 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 it's a little bit counterintuitive, but you know we do practice tight, really tight spinny turns that are fast, but often it's better to sort of turn on an arc where we're able to sort of keep a little bit more speed going through the turn. And maybe we don't turn as fast, but over time, you know, the value of not stopping really shows up not just in speed, but in energy saved. Mm -hmm. And so then that energy of how you work with the river and how 
the, the current of the river pushes off the bottom of your boat is, is, is really important. So now that's a very specific example to sort of draw this out a little bit to the bigger picture again. Yeah. I, I think what I love about the river is that it, it, it sort of reminds me that our life, how we live our life, it, it exists on, on a scale and there's sort of two ends of the scale. On one side of the scale kind of represents how we pursue contentment, however we pursue contentment, whether that's adventure, whether that's fun, whether that's, you know, taking risk or, you know, whatever that it, it, it's, it's something that you control. <clears throat> On the other side of the scale represents, you know, this river of uncertainty, the things that we don't control. And it's not about trying to find or be in a better position on the scale. It's about having the awareness to check in and see where I am on the scale, you know? And if you're leaning heavily towards, un, you know, uncertainty and feeling like you don't have a lot of control at the moment, not a problem. The main thing is you have the awareness to check in and make some choices that support that. Maybe at another moment later in the day or in the next week, you find yourself on a position on the scale more close to the side of contentment and having a lot more things being in control of more things. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of being on the river. You know, it's, it's like we love to tell ourselves and, you know, in a positive way, like, oh, we, you know, we're in control. And, you know, well, we're in control of our response. We're in control of, uh, of, you know, of some things, but whenever there's a river at play, um, we are not in control. Uh, you know, we're share, we are co-creating a life with a very uncertain force. And I think as we do that, um, I think if you get a hundred percent on the side of uncertain, that's a pretty dark place. Like we don't want to be a hundred percent, like I have no control. But on the flip side of it, if you believe you're totally 100% in control, like that's delusional, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, I've lost, I mean, I've, I've had teammates, Olympic teammates that have put a kayak on a river never to have come off that river alive. And, you know, I, I just know that the river, you know, has some uncertainty to it, you know, as does our life. And that's why I, I think the river metaphor is just so valuable not again, not to determine the correct position to be on the scale towards what we control or beyond our control, but just checking in to see where we are. And that takes self-awareness to do that on, on a regular basis. You know, that, I think that's exactly why I use and like the metaphor, because it, I mean, even though I've only been on a river less than a half, half dozen times, um, in my life, uh, let alone anything moving very fast, only that a couple times. Um, I, I think there's something very intuitive about the river is going to do what the river does, and you can't tell it what to do. So I, I think when you're trying to like convey to somebody who has like a death grip on wanting to control everything, like trying to let them know, like you simply can't. And if like using that metaphor. I feel like that it, it kind of is that wedge to open the door a little bit to the idea that, oh, I really don't have control over everything and that's okay. I, I, I just think the quicker we, we get, it's like there's a form of acceptance in it. And I mm -hmm. think within that acceptance, you know, I think one of the things that I love about this idea of kind of mapping, modeling our lives as a river not only, you know, are we making a plan through the water, you know, through this, you know, choppy, uncertain water, but I think it also forces us to kind of name our rocks in the mm -hmm. river, you know, and address the obstacles that are in the river. And so um, in doing that, you know, we're not, you know, we're shifting from this idea of like, oh, I want to get rid of all the rocks in my river. My life would be so much better if there were no rocks. And I would ask, really, is it? I mean, for me, rocks, you know, create the definition of, uh, they define the water that we're going to navigate. Mm -hmm. They deflect water to go in a certain direction. And so it's not about trying to move our rocks, take them out of the river. It's learning how to pass them in the right way. 
And I think there's a lot of counterintuitive lessons to navigating uh, whitewater rivers that when you apply that to model that to kind of navigating the river of life, uh, you know, for example, instead of avoiding your rocks, avoiding your obstacles by going way over to the side of the river where it's shallow and it's shoaly and, you know, your boat is dragging over the rocks, paddle at the rock. There's a lot of opportunity there, you know, there's a lot more water in the river flowing towards that rock in the middle of the river. And you'll find a lot of opportunity around that rock only if you're willing to confront it. And that's the same way we typically feel about obstacles in our life. Like we don't feel very good when we're avoiding obstacles, but mm -hmm. when we confront them and it's not about, you know, getting the result we want, but it's about how we feel as we navigate and pass the rocks. And over time, as you get better at this, and this, this counterintuitive idea becomes more of a practice, this is where those rocks turn, shift from becoming obstacles to becoming collaborators in your life. Well, and it, you kind of touched on this just a second ago. I feel like one of the things that's underappreciated in learning how to navigate the river is the ability to become stronger over time through practice. Like it's, it's, I think it's easy to feel, especially when you're young and inexperienced, or maybe you're old and inexperienced, I don't really know. Um, but when you don't have the strength to paddle as hard as you wish you could, or have the skill to know which way to steer the boat, that it's like, like, oh, I'm just going to keep crashing into rocks my whole life. And I, I think there's some underappreciation for understanding the like, okay, so maybe you, you ran straight into that rock. Okay. But what did you learn from that? And how does that make you stronger to navigate the next one? And that, you know, as you mentioned, like we get stronger, we get um, better as it, as we go on. I think that's right. What I sort of hear you saying, Jesse, is that I think, you know, we, we, we gain some humility mm -hmm. in, in, in the process. You know, and it's just, it's an acknowledgement. It's not, it's not a doomsday outlook on things, you know, to sort of say we don't control everything. But, um, you know, and, and again, I think the, you know, the sooner we kind of arrive at that, you know, I, I think life actually becomes very freeing and, um, and you sort of see the choices that we, we do have. The river has its way to let you know its strength, its power, its um, how unrelenting it can be and how unforgiving it can be at times. But there's also, you know, you mentioned strength, you know, you alluded to strength and power. You know, one of my favorite parts of our, our Olympic story here in La Ceo de Gé is that uh, our, the combined weight of our doubles canoe team, my, Scott Strasbaugh was my doubles canoe partner, uh, we were under 300 pounds. Uh, almost every boat in the race was, most boats in the race were, had a combined weight of over 350, many towards 375. Scott, in particular, my partner was, was really light. He was small. And, but I think what's interesting is that when you're in the water, you learn it's not about your own strength and power. It's first and foremost, connecting with the strength and power of the river. How do I take the energy of the river and sort of use my body, my boat and my paddle to kind of bring that energy into me? And I think that people can take that idea, that message, they can transfer it to their life in, in a lot of different ways. But it's like, it's sort of letting go of something. Of something. It's like, it's, you know, you earlier in our conversation, I, maybe before we hit the record button, you know, we were talking about running mm -hmm. and sort of the frequency by which we sort of get runnings, running in maybe on, the, on holidays and things. And I had this idea, I was sort of thinking, and, and it seems like you've, you know, you've kind of seen this as well. It's not about, um, it's not about how the details and, you know, of, the amount of running we do every day. To me, it's, I love the idea of, of running every day, but it's the idea of holding the idea gently. You know, where does the idea of running kind of fit into, in, into life, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
uh, I think that's always the challenge is that, and this comes with life experience, this comes with humility, is sort of holding it more gently. And that happens on the river, you know, it's like, if I hold my paddle too tight, it's like I've created all this tension in my body and all of a sudden I've given away a powerful sense of feel of, you know, feeling the water, of kind of feeling what energy exists around me for me to tap into. You know, the harder I grip the paddle, the more I kind of think, well, damn, the only energy I've got is my own. So I'm just going to paddle harder. And it's just crazy because now it's like, I, I had so many competitors that I raced against that, you know, raced by just paddling harder. And, you know, for us, it was about capturing all the energy we could of the water into our boat, into our paddle, into our body. And then whatever we have after that, we add on to it. But if we just did that, if we got really, really good at doing that, um, that would carry us, that would give us everything we need. And that, that was one of the real exciting, interesting parts of us being small, lightweight, and ultimately coming out of the Olympics, you know, as, 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 the, uh, as the top boat on that day. It, the the idea of being you know that's another thing i think we talked about before um we got recording the idea of just like capturing the energy of the things around you in life i think i was talking about in marketing in particular and just you know making the podcast and making the show and trying to make thing, everything work together um but that's something i think it, also, I, I can only speak from the American perspective, but there's something about the like the determination and grit of the American spirit and it'll push through all things. And it's like, it's almost antithesis to the idea that, you know, that current is flowing around us and maybe we try to harness that to move a direction instead of saying, well, damn the current, I'm going to paddle upstream and, you know, I'm so, I'm going to, you know, like I said, harness the American spirit and, and paddle upstream as hard as I can, and I'm going to make it no matter what. It, it, I, I think we miss out on that sometimes. Yes, and it's, you know, it, I think the people that obviously this is an incomplete metaphor, but I think sometimes the people that do the best harnessing it, we perceive it simply as luck. There is some, you know, there's some, there are some circumstances in all of our lives that don't happen for other people. And, and you can call that luck, I guess. But like, I, I think it's, to me, it's almost like the, the, the phrase about um, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Like the opportunity is the, is the current that's flowing around us. And if you prepared yourself in this case, by learning how to harness the energy of the river and by paddling enough and avoiding obstacles or or as you said driving towards them um and kind of seeing those then like you get luckier because you're starting to harness the synergies around you that are happening you know as you were talking about our sort of our determination you know i think about words like resilience grit uh toughness mental toughness i, I think these, these these are great they're great qualities I think what I've been asking a lot more, and I, I think this was sort of one of the, this was in my, uh, that post you referenced before a full deck of questions. What happens when you pair grit, determination, resilience with gratitude, mm -hmm. with self-kindness, with, um, a, you know, uh, evaluating the beauty of, of, a, of a situation? It's like, I, it's like so many things. It's like, the answer is like, we need both. And I just think that even if you want to find more resilience, more toughness, more determination, more grit in what you do, I don't think it is just as straight, like, oh, I just need to be tougher, more resilient and grittier. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you actually find ways to be more kind with yourself, to be more gentle with yourself, to be more grateful, that is that opens up the door to being more resilient, to being grittier, to being tougher. And I just think it, it's really counterintuitive, but you know, look, you'll never know unless you try. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not advocating for people to sort of jump ship and, you know, if you've been doing it a different way, 
But what I do think is like find ways to just test the idea to run a small experiment and see if it might be true. Mm -hmm. You know, just think about pairing though, you know, those two sets of like things that we would see as extremely different and find ways to sort of put them together and try it out in a couple of situations. Try to pick situations that are not make or break life or death situations, but can be actually fairly small and inc inconsequential. Mm -hmm. And just be that researcher, be that scientist and just run the experiment and see what happens. Joe, before we run out of time, um, there's a question I ask everybody. Each, so each season I have a different question. This particular season, um, there's a question I ask everybody I'm going to ask you. Um, I think, I'm hoping, despite uh, you having uh, got the Olympic gold, um, the, I think you'll still have a fairly good answer to this, um, being a well-thought-out person. <laughs> so my question uh, this season is how do you stay motivated after failing to reach a goal? Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great question. I, you know, I should probably say, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of my coaching. Most of my coaching happens through Valor Performance. So we're a performance coaching company based out of Boston and we work with clients all over the world and we have an amazing coach community. We have a, a, a lot of you know, sports psychologists working as coaches. We have a lot of Olympians and professional athletes that are working as coaches. Um, and I'm kind of known as the guy, it's like, oh yeah, yeah Joe doesn't like goals, you know? And uh, I'm just at a stage of life where it's like, and I, I, and I just want to say this thing and I, I promise I'll answer the, the question correctly yeah, no, sure, and I'm fine. on point, but um, the thing about the goals is that I just want to be really careful of not putting too much of the energy that I have today onto something that I don't yet have. I mean, the goal stands kind of out in the future and it doesn't matter. It's like, I always say, you know, my house looks at the Olympic start line and I, I was, my partner and I, we were not sitting on the start line thinking about what color medal we were going to win. That would have been like a waste of energy. Mm -hmm. And so we try to keep all of that energy in what and things we can do with it today. Like that's going to move the needle closer. Even if what you want to do is to win a gold, a gold medal, you know, you have to be present in the moment. And I would say whether, you know, you want to buy a second home on a lake or you want, you know, to have, you want to advance, you know, two, two levels up in the company that you work in. Um, it's good to know where you're going, but I find that the top performers in sport are really good at letting go of their goal so in, in, so that they can be more present in, in where they are now. And so I think that when you don't hit smaller marks, uh, I think if you can summon the awareness to kind of ask two questions uh, with, first of all, first of all, summon some self-kindness, summon some kind of uh, gratitude. And then I think two questions can be really helpful. Uh, the first one's probably a little easier than the second. And the first one is, what could be good about this? You can ask that question, like, what could be good about this? The second question is a little bit harder, but I think the answers can be even better. Uh, what am I supposed to learn? What's the lesson I'm supposed to learn here? That, I mean, depending on what, were we've fallen short of or what didn't work out for us or what didn't go our way that can be hard and even painful um but is that i think that if you can kind of find that way to ask that question when you're ready to answer it uh, what could be good about this and what's the lesson i'm, I'm supposed to learn it's a good answer joe um Joe, where can people find you? Um, maybe when's the book coming out? If yeah, you're yeah, if you're yeah. that far in the process, I don't know. No, the, the I actually think I, I I have a few things I need to learn about uh, the, the the publishing part, but the book part is actually really getting there. I okay. I don't know if it's too ambitious to do it in time for the sort of the start of summer of 2022, which is kind of a nice time when people are on on the getting you know, starting to go rafting and spend time on the water anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really nice to, to do that. But yeah, the book is really framed also as, uh, as 22 
uh, reflections about uh, life um, modeled through our journey, our own journeys down the river. And, um, and within those reflections uh, embedded in there is my Olympic story, Paddling with Scott. So it's, it, it's, it's gonna be a fairly short book. It, it's, an, it's a very reflective read. And uh, yeah, so there's that. Anyway, uh, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I'm, I'm also on, on Twitter, but my website is joejacobi.com, J-O-E-J-A-C-O-B-I.com. And uh, yeah, I'd love to connect with, uh, with your community and uh, look forward to learning about them and, and, and meeting more of them along the way. And I hope we do this conversation again sometime, Jesse. This was outstanding. Be great. Thanks for hanging out with me today, Joe. Yeah, thank you, my friend.